Hi, my name is Noor, and I'm very passionate about architecture. In this series, I'll be covering buildings from different civilizations and analyzing them with my own critique and discovering the extent of influence they have on our modern society. My story begins around 1480, or so the story goes. A boy fell through a crack in a Roman hillside into a dark subterranean kingdom. Beneath the earth he found a network of caverns that had lain undisturbed since the time of the Roman Empire. As his eyes grew accustomed to the light, he discerned weird, contorted figures painted on their walls. Contemporaries thought this underground structure was an ancient grotto. In fact, it was a remain of Emperor Nero's notorious first century palace. Called the Domus Aurea, or as in English it is called the Golden House, because of its extravagant use of precious materials, it had been buried beneath the public bath by a succeeding dynasty that revealed Nero's memory, and then forgotten. The wall paintings in which strange tendrils sprouted where columns should be and human forms were mingled with those of beasts and fabulous creatures created a sensation in Renaissance Italy. They were the first ancient paintings to be seen for a thousand years, and they contradicted everything that people expected from classical art, which was meant to be rational and mimetic, non-sensational or unrealistic responses to these forms named grotesques after the so-called grottoes where they were found, remained divided for centuries. They were imitated by Raphael and other painters up to the 9th century, and they helped inaugurate a new freedom in architecture, although many disapproved. Vitruvius, the Roman theorist of architecture, was already gripping about grotesques nearly a century before Domus Aurea was painted. Our contemporary artists decorate the walls with monstrous form rather than reproducing clear images of familiar world. Instead of columns, they painted fluted stems with oddly shaped leaves and scrolls. And instead of pediments, arborsex, arbor the same with algebra and painted window frames, on the pediments of which grow dainty flowers unrolling out of roots and topped without rhyme or reason by figurines, the little stems finally support half-figures crowned by human or animal heads. Such things, however, never existed, do not now exist, and shall never come into being. For how can a reed actually sustain a roof? Grotesques continued to raise heckles into 19th century when the great architectural moralist John Ruskin called them a monstrous abortion. Such violent actions to the decorations of Domus Aurea and their ilk are not just disputes over tastes, but responses to a much more provocative question, the moral mortality of architecture. It isn't unreasonable to focus on architecture's moral dimension, which looms men's trinkets. Everybody uses architecture, everybody lives in it. Its creation employs a lot of people, and it costs a lot of money, often public money. Over centuries, people have detected a wide garment of moral flaws in architects and patrons. Some have been accused of building for a bad purpose, extravagance in the instance of Nero's house, greed in the case of property developers, cruelty in the case of supermax prisons like the ones in America and the gulags in Russia. Others are accused of building for a bad regime. Albert Speer's designs for Hitler spring to mind, but depending on your politics, you might also include Lituan's New Delhi, the constructivist works for Stalin, Rem Kohlhaas's Chinese TV state building, or Sam's Burj Khalifa in Dubai. More frequently, architects are accused of building badly so that the results break the laws of architecture. Whatever they might be, this might not seem a question of morality, but Vitruvius's famous triumvirate of architecture virtues are Utilitas, Vensutas, and 
frumitas, or utility, beauty, and strength, or durability, have often been equated with moral laws. They've been, they've even been used to judge mere representation of architecture, as with grotesques, for how can a reed actually sustain a roof? When Vitruvius complains that grotesques are unnatural, he's reiterating the first rule of ancient art, that it should represent nature. Through architecture may seem the least mimetic of plastic arts, that hasn't stopped the people from insisting that it should follow laws derived from or imposed on nature, and seeing infractions of those laws as leading not just so to bad architecture, but moral badness. This may be questionable, but we can probably all agree with Vitruvius's third percept. A building that falls down on its inhabitants is bad, and the rule of utility, understood as fitness for purpose, has been used to justify two centuries of polemic against superfluous arraignment, leading eventually to the white boxes of modernism. Finally, there's even an enduring notion that buildings themselves can be evil. This conceited underpins countless horror films. A personal favorite is the apartment block in Ghostbusters, not the new one, the old one, designed by a deranged metallurist come occultist to focus the bad vibes of the universe. But this notion also gets taken seriously. It lies behind the idea that architecture can corrupt the morals of its users. For example, in the talk of Sing Estates and their deleterious effects on behavior of the inhabitants. Nero was one of the most viled, reviled Caesars. The Middle Ages, remembering his persecution of the early Christians, called him anarchist. Many Romans too had found him monstrous, many, but by not all means, there were a post Thomas cult devoted to him in, in his memory. His disastrous reign brought down the first imperial dynasty and left Rome in a state of civil war. So it's hardly surprising that his personality got a drubbing, especially from a republican-minded writer. According to his ancient biographers, Nero indulged in all kinds of outrageous debituaries. He kicked his pregnant wife to death, slept with and then murdered his own mother, raped a versatile virgin and castrated a young boy before making him his wife. As historian Edward Chaplin remarks, this charade seems like a subversion of Demantio and Ad Vesitas condemnations to beast, with the emperor as beast punishing the condemned by fellating them. It's characteristics of a man who seemed held bent on undermining what it meant to be emperor by performing on stage as an actor, for instance, or by sexually submitting to a freedom freed man. Another of the counts against Nero was the allegation that he started the Great Fire of Rome, which lasted a full nine days in the summer of 64 AD. Suetonius says that the emperor played his lyre while Rome burned, not the fiddle of legend in any case, even though ancient sources are a bit skeptical about this. Much of the cities, including parts of Nero's palace, was reduced into smoking rubble but according to Tacitius, the destruction was welcomed in one quarter. Nero, meanwhile, availed himself of his country's desolation and erected a mansion in which the jewels and gold, long familiar objects quite vulgarized by our extravagance, were not so marvelous as the fields and lakes. This wonder was the golden house, worried by suspicions that he'd started the fire to clear ground for his new palace. Nero placed the blame for the conflagration on the Christians, a persecution once instigated that led to the martyrdoms of saints, such as Saint Peter and Saint Paul. Could any building made by such a ruler be good? Even Suetonius, to whom Nero's crimes were still politically dangerous, was able to separate the emperor from his works, some of which he praised, while Nero was taking advantage of the ravages of the fire to clear a huge expanse of central Rome for his palace. He also imposed new planning rules on the city in orders to create a safer, more regulated environment and paid for much of the reconstructions from his own pocket. The emperor also constructed 
state-of-the-art public buildings, which provoked a contemporary to remark, what is worse than narrow, what is better than narrow's baths? Is this such a simple matter, though, to untangle a building from its patron? Nazi architecture is a good test case, since it was built by a truly bad regime. Indeed, there is something Neorian about the way that the Nazis turned their victims into illuminating objects, making lampshades, it is alleged, of Jewish skin, Jewish skin. But is Nazi architecture morally bad? Jewish refugee Nicholas Pevenzer in his outline of European architecture. Let's go to the subject with the less said, the better. For him, it was too cack-handed in his attempt to throw off the modernism and return to the classical or medieval past. The Italian fascists, on the other hand, he thought rather more successful, since for a noble vulgar display no one can compete with the Italians. Donatello has long since trounced Donatello, but this was after Pavenzo's time when we can forgive his ignorance of Versace, but his subscriptions to the same kind of racial essentialism that underpinned and undermined Nazi doctrine is harder to swallow.